In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, as we forge ahead into this um, very important and interesting letter that St. Paul wrote, we ask you once again to gift us with your presence, specifically your presence in the form of your Holy Spirit, to lead and guide us today. We ask you, Lord, to just enliven our hearts and enrich our minds, to give us a deeper appreciation of just how good you are. Let us leave today with um, uh, an increased hope, an increased faith, and a vigor to embrace the vocation and the call that you have for us and our confidence to succeed in whatever difficulties we must conquer. I ask this through the power of the Holy Spirit and today specifically through the intercession of St. Paul. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Last week we completed chapter 3. Today I would like to do chapter 4, maybe even get into 5 if that's possible. There's six chapters in Galatians, and I, my intention is to complete the study next week, all right? Okay. So I want to very briefly uh, recap chapter three, just to give us a running start so we can jump into four without any uh, baggage, right? So chapter three was right in the heart of St. Paul's theology, but he went through it very rapidly. It wasn't the systematic, calculated, intellectual Paul that we see in Romans. This was his letter, remember, to people that he loved, pers knew personally, had a personal relationship with, and who now he feels like are being contaminated by false teaching to their de detriment. So this is the angry Papa Paul writing a letter that's not dispassionate, it's very passionate. And he writes with... with um, exclamatory terms that are you think well that's not very diplomatic but he doesn't he's not trying to be diplomatic All right, he's trying to be uh, 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 he's trying to be impactful he almost has a, an anxiety here to quickly put down this heresy that's infecting his spiritual children right he's chastising them, he's chastising them yes he calls them stupid <laughs> twice in chapter 3 that's not exactly kind and cuddly right right <laughs> uh, but he's even madder at the heretics, the Judaizers that have come in. Now, we might say, well, what's Paul so worked up about? If they get circumcised or uncircumcised, which seems to be the big issue here, what's the problem? But for Paul, the whole reason for Christ was to set the people of the world, including the Jewish people, free from the Mosaic law, which he said was not the original promise of God. That came to Abraham, and it had none of the Mosaic covenant stipulations on it. That came 400 years later. And it's a system that included promises if you kept it perfectly, but curses if you didn't. And he's saying history has proven that no one kept it perfectly. And if you break any part of the law, you're a lawbreaker, therefore, and you incur the curses. His circumcision, he says, uh, inducts you into that plan, back into that imperfect, incapable plan of achieving justification in the eyes of God. Why would you want to go back to that? We're now saved. Christ fulfilled all the requirements of the law and has given us instead an opportunity to be justified with God and right standing with God through grace, which is the power of God and the merits of Jesus Christ, who himself took on the curses of the law so we could be freed from it. So he's saying it's stupid then to in any form think that I need to go back to that inferior and incapable and impossible way of achieving a right relationship with God. So don't do it. Don't do it. So to him it's a very, very big deal. Okay? All right. So he presented that argument rapidly in chapter 3 basically by first appealing to their remembrance of the, their experience with the Holy Spirit. He said, when I came to you and you experienced miracles and you had this overwhelming, dramatic experience of God through the Holy Spirit, he doesn't describe it for us, but it must have been, he didn't, he didn't even try to remind them. He says, you know what happened. So it must have been quite a dose of the ghost, right? Right? I mean, they got it. And so we don't know what happened, but he, he feels like, Remember that. Did that come because you were circumcised? Did that come because you ate kosher foods? Did that come because of any part of the Mosaic law? No, it came because you believed what I preached to you about Jesus Christ. 
and his gift of grace. That was first. Then he went in to explain how the covenant with Abraham, which preceded the covenant with Moses by 400 years, was the original and superior promise of God, not just to the descendants of Abraham in the flesh, but the descendants of Abraham in faith. That they were for all people as one of the promises. I think we're going to get into that a little bit today. That The universal promises that included the Gentiles were given to Abraham, right? And the man who was first called justified in the Old Testament, but by faith, not because of any keeping of the works of the law, as he said, okay? What else did he do? He went back then to appeal, to try to explain then what was the purpose of the law. If it was so, if it was such a problem, why did God even give it to Moses and the Jewish people? And he was saying it was necessary because you proved yourself to be a rebellious children. And I had to add more laws to keep you in, in check. That would be God's answer through Paul, right? You needed more and more and more stipulations to remind you, I want you to be different from the rest of the world. I want you, this is serious. I want to insulate you by your practice and your thought and your worldview from the, from the lesser and wrong-headed uh, practices of the rest of the world. It was given to instruct you in what was right and wrong. It was given to re remind you very acutely of your sinfulness. It was given to help you build an appetite and an understanding that we need a Redeemer. And I intended to preserve a people from whom I could eventually bring the Redeemer, the Messiah, as they came to call him, when the time had come. Okay? Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Then this name has named me for years. And let me just try to get that one question. Moses was the great prophet, the lawgiver, okay? And he, he apparently wrote the vast majority of the laws, like you said. That's the narrative understanding. The Deuteronomy and Leviticus, yeah, given, which is where the law is. Yeah. Give them a busy one so that they're so tied up they're not going to be doing other goofy things. All right. Keep them under control. But if the law of law, if the Mosaic law has led so many people into uh, like spiritual oblivion, how could that have all been inspired by the Well, I wouldn't say they called them into spiritual oblivion. It called them into a state of mind where they understood their spiritual need. Okay? But they couldn't it, succeed. So how they couldn't succeed. But, but now they too are going to be redeemed by Jesus Christ. All right? I mean, we understand that, that they lived in an age of preparation, but it doesn't mean they were predestined to go to hell. We would never say that. They were the people of God. They were the chosen people of God and always will be. But chosen for what? For a relationship with God exclusive of any that anyone else in the world could have? Paul would say, no, I now understand that. He says, he says they were, it, to them the promises were given. To them, the, the Ten Commandments, which were not, by the way, part of the law. I need to get into that a little bit today, too, because that's also misunderstood by some. The now we're redeemed from the law, so does that also include the moral law? And of course, that's not. All right, the Ten Commandments came before the rest of the Mosaic Law. They were added on. Originally, the Ten Commandments, that was the whole national idea. That was going to be their moral code, their, their, their system of government, right? their system of ethics, the whole bit. The rest was all added to that to keep them in bounds. Like I told you, if you had a, a child that was, had good sense and made all the right decisions, you wouldn't need to add a million other rules into how they were going to you know, live their life. Before you go to school in the morning, come in here and we'll see how you're dressed. Right? Have you been there? <laughs> right? I know school's out at 3.30. You better be home at 4. Because that's all it takes you to get home. If you're not home at 4, I know you're probably up to something, right? So that you understand the, I mean, it's just a human dynamic, right? So it was given for a very good purpose, a holy purpose, right? But his thesis is that it was only given until the time of fulfillment came, the age of grace. And he will get into that more in chapter 4 where he sort of, Finishes rounding out his argument with a couple more and then a couple of allegories. Uh, so, it was, no, it wasn't intended to doom them. It was intended to limit the amount of self-damage they could, could do. And to, and to make them clear that through their own 
righteousness. Through their own attempt to obey rules, they couldn't get there. Right? If they could, there was no need for Jesus. Because they already had a system capable of salvation. Right? So no way are we trying to demean um, the Mosaic Law as useless or definitely not something evil. God, it was a gift. Just like all the rules you give on a rebellious child are a gift. They don't look at it that way, necessarily. You know, why were you so strict with me? This is because I didn't want you to end up in rehab or jail or dead. That's why, right? Or in any more mortal sin than you already put yourself. Right? You understand, okay? It's just, so that's it. So it was to limit the extent to which they had proven themselves, like all human beings, apart from grace, can go. Isn't, it appears in the story, if we're just reading this as a story, he, God took these people and pulled them out of a, of a barbarian existence and did give them... As slaves. And sla as, but it's something that we still live by uh, all through the ages. Thou shalt not kill. I mean, today it's a law. You can't do that, but you know this barbarian world killed it willy-nilly. Right. So, right. That so the Ten Commandments were supposed to be codified into even if it wasn't, it was supposed to be actually their laws of the nation, but it was at least supposed to be their moral code of defining what is right and what is wrong. Don't don't steal. Mm -hmm. Don't don't lie under oath. Mm -hmm. Don't lie in general. Mm -hmm. Don't take your neighbor's stuff. Definitely don't kill them. Don't run around with your neighbor's wife. Although we think that, so, well, duh. But I mean, that was put it explicitly into some things that were acceptable in some cultures. He said, no, not for you. Not for you. Let me, I mean, let me help your conscience get a little bit more solidified on the basics. We always say, well, right and wrong depends on what my conscience tells me. No, 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 no. If a conscience was rightly formed, that would be right. But we humans have a terrible ability to skew our conscience into accepting some things that are wrong and calling them right, and then just getting comfortable with it. So the, 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 the bar is not the wrong I can get comfortable with in time. Right and wrong, we would say, is objective and is defined by God. What God says is right is right. What God says is wrong is wrong. And it doesn't matter if you agree. It doesn't matter if you've been able to placate your conscience into accepting something else. We Judeo-Christians would say right and wrong is defined and it begins with the moral code. So we are, in chapter 5 specifically, is going to talk about we've been saved for freedom. But it's important for us to know freedom from what? And freedom for what? Right? It's to keep the moral code, which is the way to righteous living, uh, to successful living, to abundant life. It's not freedom from any laws. No, because first and foremost, they were worshiping every rock and stone on the planet. And he said, that the first, just, I am the Lord. Right. So say, well, I'm a moral person, so I think I should worship and recognize some uh, mystical otherness. Which could be, you know, the sun, or the star, or lots of stars, or cows, or graven images he said no let me define that okay. that rightful urge in you I'm the only guy out here I'm God only God treating anybody or anything else as God is wrong and that it all starts there because if you accept I am God therefore what I say is right and wrong is your right and wrong if you throw me off as just one opinion amongst many, you're not going to get any of the rest of it right. Because you're liable to find another religious code that says some of those things are okay. Right? Yes. It makes sense. The order of them is okay. It's perfectly okay. All right? All right. Galatians 4, first 1 through 11. Um, and he's going to explain how we people of the new covenant we people who are putting our hope of salvation in the grace of Jesus Christ are equivalent to children that come of age. All right? That they come of age and things change. All right? He says, 
What I'm saying is this. An heir, during the time while he is still underage, is no different from a slave. Even though he is the owner of all the property, he is under the control of guardians and administrators until the time fixed by his father. So too with us. As long as we were still underage, we were enslaved to the elemental principles of this world. But when the completion of the time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, born a subject of the law, to redeem the subjects of the law so that we could receive our adoption as sons. As you are sons, God has sent into our hearts the spirit of his son, crying, Abba, Father. Remember what I told you. Justification in Catholic theology is equivalent to divine sonship. We are saved not because suddenly everything we do is okay, but because we are now considered children of God. And, in, and salvation, heaven, is an inheritance. And that's the language he's using here exactly. And it happens because we now, in the age of grace, are able to receive the Holy Spirit into us, which changes us ontologically, our nature, so that we are now not just children of Adam anymore, but children of God. And so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir by God's own act. But formerly, when you did not know God, you were kept in slavery to things which are not really God's at all, like Missy was saying. Whereas now that you have come to recognize God, or rather be recognized by God, he says, how can you now turn back again to those powerless and bankrupt elements whose slaves you now want to be all over again? You keep special days and months and seasons and years. I'm beginning to be afraid that I may, after all, have wasted my efforts with you. All right? Now, he's talking to people who are tempted to return to the Jewish system. But he's kind of saying, in a way, and it sounds like he's talking about pagans. Well, he doesn't consider his own people pagans by any way. But he's also saying that is a lesser system, and in some ways, a step back into a hopeless situation that's not, for you pagans, is not much. You're just looking for what you used to look for, but now on a different goal, Okay. So the analogy here is that even children of the king, while they're children, are given instructors and protectors and teachers and guardians who have authority over them, right? Teach them right and wrong, teach them in the ways of the world, perhaps punish them when they do wrong, right? Snitch on them when they're doing wrong, right? They have authority under those that are not heirs, and it's a God-given a parentally given wisdom. We say babysitters, all right? Maybe babysitters or nannies or whatever. Maybe you don't like the word slaves. I'd say, right, but, you know, it, you're, given as, you're given under the authority of someone else until you come of age, until the parents come home and then the babysitter relieves, or you come to a certain age that you now are, are inducted into the full status as the heir, Right? However you want to look at it, whether that's 18 or 21, or whenever God feels like it, you know. Um, I'm not sure. Right. Much 45. Probably the year after next, right? <laughs> yeah. No, but you understand. So the analogy he's using here is trying to take from human experience that hopefully we all understand and agree. A child is certainly, a child of the king is the heir to the kingdom. But the king doesn't give a five-year-old the authority and the power of the kingdom, right? No, he's got to be instructed where he's capable of handling it. Until that time, he doesn't walk around operating with the full prerogatives of being the son of the king. Okay? Okay. All right. And that would especially be true for rebellious children. Right? So a rebellious child might be saying, well, dad, when do I get it? When do I get the money? You know, when do I get the power? When do I get my own little army? When can I go out and just... And he says, not now. Not yet. To another child, it might be much earlier, right? All right, so it's up to God in his wisdom to decide that. And so especially for rebellious children, it's very important they be kept under more rules and more instruction and more administration, more control, all right? And he's saying that is another analogy of why God gave Mosaic Law. Okay, because they were proving themselves to be willing to spin out of control too early. And it wasn't time yet for that kind of freedom. So he's saying, so, so don't go back. All right, verses 4, 
I mean, chapter 4, verse 12 through 20. I urge you, brothers, be like me. This is more of a personal appeal. Now he's going he's gonna to play the tender parent card because he lived with them. He loved them. They loved him. He's going to call. He's going to call that out now. Now, now is a little bit more of a personal pain section. I urge you, brothers, be like me, as I have become like you. You have never been unfair to me. Indeed, you remember that it was an illness that first gave me the opportunity to preach the gospel to you. Okay, so maybe he was on the way to somewhere else and got sick, and decided I need to stay here a while, and that began his whole ministry with them. Right, right. But through my illness, that though my illness was a trial to you, you did not show any distaste or revulsion. Instead, you welcomed me as a messenger of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. What has happened to the utter contentment you had then? For I can testify to you that you would have plucked your eyes out, were it possible, and given them to me. Then have I turned into your enemy simply be, by being truthful to you? Their devotion to you has no praiseworthy motive. He's talking about the Judaizers, right? They simply want to cut you off from me so that you may center your devotion on them. Devotion to a praiseworthy cause is praiseworthy at any time, but only devotion to a praiseworthy cause is praiseworthy at any time, not only when I am there with you. My children, I'm going through the pain of giving birth to you all over again until Christ is formed in you. And how I wish I could be there with you at this moment and find the right way of talking to you. I'm quite at a loss with you. All right, so if they didn't realize it before, they now see Paul, his heart is breaking, okay? His heart is breaking. How could you do this with, to me, your mama? Right? <laughs> All right, so he plays that card too. It's tender. It's authentic, I would say. So he went to the, he reminded them of their relationship, their, their uh, experience of the Holy Spirit, but he's also reminding them of the tender, honest, personal relationship they had with him when they trusted each other. And so what's changed? What's changed? Okay. I'm letting, I'm being quiet because I want that to sink in. I want you to feel some of Paul's pain, right? Okay. All right, then, then he goes on and he pulls out a couple of allegories to explain this relationship. And we're going to have to take a little bit of an aside here, I think, to um, review a story. Because he's referring now to the story that we're not as familiar with, that he thinks they're very familiar with. He's going to talk, start talking about Hagar and Sarah and Ishmael and Isaac. All right, some of us know that story better than others, but his allegories make no sense if we don't. But what he's going to try to make the distinction between is that Abraham had descendants in the flesh, but he also has descendants in the spirit. Okay. And he wants them to understand you are descendants in the spirit because of faith of Abraham. You can rightly call yourselves, even though you're Gentiles, descendants of Abraham. Don't then revert to the opposite, which is an inferior relationship with an inferior covenant. Okay? You remember when we did the study on Genesis? I don't know, it was three or four years ago, but maybe you don't. But the, the story of Abraham is in Genesis. The story of Abraham, who was a pagan, remember? He lived in Ur of Chaldee. He was an Iraqi before they were Iraqis. All right? And... Um, God appeared to this man, spoke to him and said, I want you to pick up and leave at 85 years old and go to a land that I'm going to give to you and your descendants far away. Now, Abraham believed, but that's not when he was called righteous. He's called righteous once he picked up and did it. All right. So he picked up, he took uh, Lot, his nephew, his wife, Sarai. He was still called Abram, by the way, uh -huh. at this point. And they left, all right? Along the way, in the life of Abraham, let's go to chapter 12 first. That's where the call is. Yahweh said to Abram, Leave your country, your kindred, and your father's house for a country which I shall show you. And I shall make you a great nation. I shall bless you and make your name famous. 
and you are to be a blessing. I shall bless those who bless you and shall curse those who curse you. And all clans on earth will bless themselves by you. This is where it begins. It's a process in the life of Abram. And he's going to say it's been a process in the life of the human race to fulfill it. But this is a threefold promise given to Abram. I will give you a land. I will make of your descendants a nation. And specifically, your descendants will have a dynasty over that nation. Kings. And then, eventually, I will bring forth from your descendants a blessing for all people. For all the world. You got it? Now, in the life of Abram, we see each of those promises being upgraded into a covenant. Now, a covenant is always founded on an oath, I swear. Mm -hmm. no, matter what. no matter what. And then also by the, a sacrifice which in, involves the shedding of blood. Right? Mm -hmm. All right. So the first, I will give you a land, is upgraded into a covenant in chapter 15. All right? In chapter 15. This is, this is the animal sacrifice. And I think Larry talked about it. Where God told Abram, take some animals, split them in half. That's the blood. And then he put Abram in a trance because it wasn't going to be Abram that uh, establishes this covenant. It's going to be God. And God, in the form of a smoking fire pot, passes between the split halves of the, the uh, sacrificed animals. Okay? All right. So in chapter 15... 15, uh, stay around. I am, and he says as he does this, I am Yahweh who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this country as your possession. Lord Yahweh, Abraham, Abram replied, how can I know that I shall possess it? He said to him, bring me three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old she-goat, three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought him all these, split the animals down the middle, placed each half opposite the others, the birds he did not d divide. And whenever birds of prey swooped down on the carcasses, Abram drove them off. As the sun was on the point of setting, a trance fell on Abram, and a deep, dark dread descended on him. Then Yahweh said to Abram, Know this for certain, that your descendants will be exiles in a land not your own. Hundreds of years later is when they go to Egypt, right? He doesn't have these descendants yet, right? They will be oppressed for 400 years. But I shall bring judgment on the nation that enslaves them, and after this they will leave with many possessions. For your part, you will join your ancestors in peace. You will be buried at a happy old age. In the fourth generation, they will come back here in the promised land. For until then, the iniquity of the Amorites will not have reached its full extent. And when the sun had set and it was dark, there appeared a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passing through the animal's pieces. And that day, Yahweh made a covenant with Abram in these terms. To your descendants, I give you this country... From the river of Egypt to the great Euphrates. I want you to think about if you have the geography of the Middle East in your mind. That's a big chunk of real estate. <laughs> he said from the river in Egypt to the river Euphrates. What does that include? Most of Iraq, a chunk of Egypt, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. Right. A, lo a lot a lot of land, but I want you to keep that in mind because Israel, I think we can tie that in in a minute because Israel's just a tiny, a tiny sliver of that. Okay. Then, we go on in chapter 17. The promise to have that a dynasty will come from your descendants, right? That over this, this people, you all always have a king reigning. And this is when Isaac is born. Okay, chapter 17. The oath is given. Now, Abram is now 99 years old. Okay, Isaac is born. The covenant is circumcision. Okay, that's the blood. And now God speaks an oath. And he's 99 years old. He says, I am El Shaddai. Live in my presence. Be perfect. And I shall grant a covenant between myself and you and make you very numerous. Abram bowed to the ground. God spoke to him as follows. For my part, this is my covenant with you. You will become the father of many nations. 
I'm changing your name now from Abram to Abraham. Your name is to be Abraham, which is father of a multitude. Abram was father of, mighty father, mighty father. That's what it was. Abraham is father of a multitude. I'll make you the father of many nations. And you're no, you are no longer to be called Abram. Your name is to be Abraham. For I'm making you the father of many nations. And I shall make you exceedingly fertile. This is to a 99-year-old man. I shall make you into nations, and your issue will be kings. Okay? Jumping down to verse 11. This is my covenant, which you must keep between myself and you, and your descendants after you. Every one of your males must be circumcised. You must circumcise the flesh of your foreskin. This will be the sign of the covenant between myself and you, as soon as they are eight days old. Okay? We have to remember that. Eight days old. He also changed Sarai's name to Sarah, which means queen mother. Okay? He did all that in chapter 17. And Abram's 99 years old. All right. Finally, at the age of, uh, in, chapter, in Genesis chapter 22, the third promise to make you a universal blessing. This is when God decided to test Abram's faith. And he said, I want you to take Isaac, who's been born now, who's now about 15, 16 years old. I want you to take him up Mount Moriah, which is Jerusalem. And I want you to sacrifice him. Now this is the son through whom the promises are supposed to come. He's been told to sacrifice him. He goes up and not knowing what's going to happen, I guess he figured that God would raise him from the dead after he killed him. He decides to do it. And on the way that the dagger is coming down, the angel stops his hand and says, I now know your faith is strong. After all we've been through, your faith is strong. This promise of a universal blessing will come through Isaac. But the sacrifice is not going to be Isaac's blood. I will provide the sacrifice. At the time being, sacrifice that ram over there that's tangled up in the bushes. The mystery of what will the ultimate sacrifice be that God will provide then is when the Son of God carries the wood of his sacrifice, just as Isaac did, up Mount Moriah and offers himself up there, and that's Jesus Christ. All right, so the fulfillment of each of these covenants then. So for the land, it is um, uh, the covenant established in, uh, I told you, to the, to the, the animals and the smoking pie, fire pot. That is fulfilled when Moses... To Moses at Mount Sinai. Okay? That is fulfilled there. And then they pass over the Jordan River and they take possession of the land. The dynasty, of course, and that was a, that was a covenant as well. All right? Then the, the dynasty promises were fulfilled in King David. Where God is, has a covenant with him. The third and finest, most the universal blessing covenant was not fulfilled until Jesus Christ. All right? So that's the story. Now, in there, however, we do have a story that where Abram and Sarah, Sarah initiated, but Abram cooperated, saying, look, I know God's going to give us these promises to his son, but I'm too old to have a son. Therefore, you need to take my slave girl, an Egyptian slave named Hagar, and I want you to make her pregnant, and the child will be my child, and he did it. And that's Ishmael, okay? Now, God, Abram loved it. Ishmael. God loved Ishmael and Hagar, all right? But God says that wasn't the way it was going to happen. You know, he was going by God helps those that help themselves, which is not in Scripture. <laughs> so you've done this thing, but that's not what I ever intended. Thirteen years later, Isaac is born. He t I, he's, that's when he's told circumcise Isaac on the eighth day. And he circumcised the rest of the males in the household too, including Ishmael, but he was 13 years old. The Egyptians had already been, had already been circumcising for centuries. They didn't do it on the eighth day. They did it on the 13th year. All right. So it was a signal that I don't cons it's, not, it's not Ishmael, that these prom the greatest promise is going to come from. However, God does give promises to Hagar and Ishmael. Right? He, he, said, excuse me, he, he says, uh, Ishmael ends up having 12 sons, 12 tribes. And he gives him land promises too. 
the same ones. So I ask you, now, according to the Jewish tradition, the descendants of Ishmael are the Arabs. Have their own covenant. Have their own promises. Not the promise of universal blessing. That was through Isaac. But there were other promises too, remember? One was for the... So I ask you now, when you think of the land between the river in Egypt and the river Euphrates, who inhabits 90% of that land? Arabs do. Hmm. So, God took care of if Hagar and Ishmael were eventually uh, expelled because the competition, especially from Sarah, she said, I, you know, she, she thinks her son is the firstborn, blah, blah, blah. They were expelled, but God took care of them. All right? Gave them their own covenant, took care of them in the desert, led them to where they were going to be, and established a covenant with them on Mount Sinai, which is in Arabia. Okay? The covenant established through Isaac was on Mount Mariah. Mariah. All right, so that's the story. I'm not going to read the whole chapter because I just told you the essence of it. In the rest of chapter 4, where he's going to give the allegories there. These are not proof texts. He's just he's trying to draw comparisons between a story they knew well, but we had to go back and learn a little bit, to understand that there is a covenant that was good, but it wasn't the best. The best. All right, and just as there was Hagar and Ishmael, there was Sarah, your only wife, he said, and Isaac, your true firstborn son of the promise. All right? So here again, he says, do you, and he also says that their covenant with Ishmael was established on Mount Sinai, which later is also the same place that the covenant with Moses was established. Okay? The covenant with Isaac was established on Mount Moriah, which is the same place that the covenant with Jesus was established. So he uses the allegory of Hagar and Sarah, of Ishmael and Isaac, and of Sinai and Jerusalem to say, you are now called to be descendants of the Spirit, descendants of the promise. Don't now seek to somehow to be a descendant of the flesh. That's the point of the allegory. Does it make sense? I hope. Questions on that? Don't ask too hard of ones. <laughs> yes? I think it shows too, it's such a great example that um, Paul brought this out here because it shows how serious God is about this new covenant. You can't be slave and free at the same time. I mean, to cast Ishmael out. You know, cast out, cast out is, is, is a harsh way of saying it. He was cast out, but he was separated and now had his own destiny. That's what happened. And it happened. That's right. That's the point. Ishmael was not cursed. Hagar was not cursed. He was given his own promises through his own 12 tribes, etc. But, but his point was that that covenant did not include the promise of the future Messiah. The universal blessing for all mankind that would come through him was to come through Isaac. All right? Just as God said, and even though you took things into your own hands, so to speak, uh, that wasn't the way it was going to be. I am now going to take care of them, but that wasn't my original plan. My original plan is intact. And your sinfulness or your pridefulness or your lack of faith isn't enough to derail the plan. All right? Why did he specifically let Abram and Sarah get so old before they had Isaac? So it was very clear it wasn't them, right? They were way past the Mendoza line, okay? <laughs> right? But through, through, through the, the story of all of Scripture, God bringing forth a son from she who was called barren is the way he demonstrated this child has got a special destiny, right? Okay. We have Samuel born that way. We have John the Baptist born that way. We have Jesus born that way. She who is a virgin. She's not supposed to have, not supposed to be able to get pregnant, right? J.R. Footnote said that uh, Ishmael was born in the human in the flesh. Right. He was a physical descendant of Abraham. Of Abram. But then 
uh, Isaac was born of the Spirit. Right. Right. He was also born of the flesh. But the, the spiritual, the greater covenant, and that's another way of saying that, was to come through him. All right? It's not, to, it's not to curse anybody else. It's to say the greatest of all of the promises of God is the universal blessing for all people, including you Gentiles that I'm writing to now. And that came through Isaac. Okay? What I'm seeing here as well, maybe I might be skew on this, but I'm beginning on verse 24. Now this is an allegory. Yeah. These women represent two covenants. One right. was from Mount Sinai bearing children for slavery. Yep. This is Hagar. Hagar represents Sinai, a mountain in Arabia. Corresponds right. to the Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. Almost like the law, if we're talking about the law of slavery, comes from Mount Sinai. What, where does Jesus come from? If you look at, again, where Abraham takes Isaac, he takes him to Moriah. Right. And that's where God says, I will provide... I will provide the sacrifice. The sacrifice for you. A ram's head caught in a thicket. You know, the crown of thorns that Jesus wears. Crown of thorns, there you go. Yeah. So, two different mountains. Two different covenants, one of slavery and one of freedom. Exactly. You got it. That's his point. He's going to expound on that even more in chapter 5. Now, now that he hopes we get the allegory, and it's supposed to, he wants our synapses to start circling around the thought that you just had now. So, what's the implications of that? What does it mean? All right? He's just saying, he said, one was good, but you now have the invitation to enter into what was, is so far superior. Why would you want to? go back and to try to tie into a previous system that has proved itself incapable, maybe some blessings, but not of the greatest blessing, which is justification, salvation, divine sonship with God. Yes, One of the things that uh, Isaiah talks about is, in, is Assyria was allowed to um, punish them for their impiety. They were impious. They had the law, but they were impious. And so that was why right. the Assyrian king was allowed to do what he did. And, and the Babylonians and Babylonians. the Philistines and you can even say the Greeks and the Romans. Why? It was necessary for them to be dismantled, derailed on the path that they were going. It's rebooting, right? Uh, and, and, and all of those were after prophet after prophet calling them back to correct their ways before it's too late. And ultimately, you know, what God promised happened and it wasn't right. great. But. I think when they're using the word, or when, when Isaiah uses the word impious, it's like the beginning of the fear of God is piety, piousness. And so in, in their rejection of the law by being impious, they were rejecting their fear of God. Right. There are, if you read the whole story, there are times they totally forgot about the Ten Commandments, totally forgot about the law. That after being conquered, and then sort of having a remnant that's rebooting now, they would find a discarded parchment rendition of the covenant that God established with Moses, and they would read it, and they're going, oh my God, no wonder we're, we're convicted. Because we, we were so far off of that, now they should be sincerely irritated at their forefathers who had not passed this, this covenant on, because there were so many blessings there that we missed. And instead, we, we incurred these curses. But when, when the, 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 the people of God stood up and said, yes, we accept this covenant. We accept those terms. I mean, that implied that we were going to keep it and pass it on and teach it to our children. They failed to do that. And their descendants paid for it. When I read Maccabees, that gives me like the how. We hear a lot in the scriptures about the what. They were in, they, that they um, uh, showed their disdain. That they, dis, they, whatever it was that they did. But when you read Maccabees, that's the how. It's like, oh my God. They were willing to, to sacrifice their love of the law and their love of, of, of uh, freedom just by bowing to the king yeah. and saying, uh, you know, and they were even trying to convince him, uh, just, just do this and, and you'll live. Right. And, so Maccabees is, um, that refers to a time of the, 
the most recent occupation of Israel before the Romans came in. All right, so that's the uh, after the Greeks, you had the Seleucid kings and Antiochus Epiphanes, I think his name. He was terrible, and he controlled that area, and he was just so wicked. Not only demanded that they speak Greek, but they worshipped the Greek gods. Even offered, he put up a pagan symbol in the temple. He was forcing them all to eat pork, right? It was just like, how low can I grind your nose in this? And then Judas Maccabeus and his sons rose up and said, we're not going to do it. We may die, but we're going to revolt against this. And they won. All right. So that's what the book of Maccabees, First and Second Maccabees, is all about. And it's about them finally. And for a, they had some form of autonomy until the Romans came, about 200 years later, right? So that's, that's the story that you're talking about. And I mean, that's almost like a three-dimensional. I mean, when you look at it, it just gives you the how. How are the things that they did? What were the things that they did? And how did it affect their lives? Um, the, uh, the mother watched her sons being killed before her right. because they refused. And she says, I only wish I had more sons. Yeah. yeah. Right. You think, yuck. Right. So that, but that's the story. It's about heroism. And it's also a story about God preserving a remnant, even the most wicked of times. And that how... Wicked, evil people seem to triumph, but they don't. They don't. They don't. For a time, evil has its moment, you know. But, but it's only a moment because the author and the authority of time and history is, is God Almighty. All right? And he's able to take from the remnant and rebuild Get everything back on course again. So another, I guess you could say our ability to sin is huge. But it's not bigger than God's ability to save. Okay? That's the story. Paul says all of the events in the Old Testament have been recorded for our benefit. Right? They could have been stories that just happened and are lost to history. Like, you know, the battles of the Hittites and so many other cultures who had their own history but we know very little about He's saying the old, the Hebrew scriptures are there so that we can learn the allegories, the metaphors, the prototypes of the new covenant reality. Okay, and the more we understand them, the more informed and rounded out we are about the gift and the reality that we live in. Paul knew that because he was steeped in the Old Testament. And, he's, and like I said, after he went through the school of the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden he, what the stuff, stuff he thought was important just exploded in its informative value because all of a sudden he's saying, man, it's all there. You know, he's prob these Galatians are probably not the only ones he called stupid. Because I could see him in the desert as he's, Holy Spirit's inviting him to go back and really understand what he thought he knew and he's just going, stupid, 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 stupid. Right? You know? I could see him doing that. He says, I got to go tell everybody. You know, I was a teacher of the law. The other teachers of the law, we're getting it wrong. We're telling the wrong conclusion, the wrong story. I got to go out and get it right. You know, that propelled him. No wonder he was mad when it was going back. Right. And then he hears people wanting to go back to that. He's going, ah! Don't, don't do it. Right? I don't know if Paul had any hair, but he probably wanted to pull what was left of it out. <laughs> well, it's like our children. <laughs> They keep doing the same thing over again. You want to go, eh. To them. <laughs> and them and you, right. It's right. It breaks your heart. But anger in an instructive way is a, is a proper response too. Because you don't want to say, I love you so much. I'm just not going to, I'm going to, you know, I don't want you to get angry with me. I don't want to hurt our relationship. You just, you just keep on doing what you're doing and it's okay. I'll get over it. That's the, that's the understanding of God we would like to have a lot of times. But God loves us too much to leave us there. We've talked before about if you had somebody hit, determined to run full speed and head over a cliff and they weren't stopping because you were yelling at them, it's not an unloving thing to pick up an iron bar and break their leg. Because a broken leg is better than going over a thousand foot cliff, right? Yeah, well, you're not going to put God in jail for it, but, he, but he's done that through history to us. So he does that to us individually, I believe. At times. We say, why is there suffering? Well, that's a great mystery. But sometimes it's to derail us and make us reboot. And realize the path I was on was to destruction. I've heard that many times with guys in prison, you know. I've heard that many times with some of the stories come out of Graceway. 
It's just, I mean, that's in a dramatic fashion of maybe what we've all experienced from time to time. When you hit a brick wall suddenly that you didn't know was there or you thought you were going to run through, you realize, man, that didn't work. <laughs> yeah. If you're smart, it gets you on your knees. All right. In your arrogance, it might just decide to try another way to do it. All right. Chapter 5. Big question here is, so how does justification by faith occur? Okay. And here's where I first want to deal a little bit with a modern contention between once saved, always saved. Okay. I'm saved by faith in Jesus Christ. Okay. I believe in Jesus Christ. Therefore, I'm saved. And I'm now free from having to do anything right, right? It doesn't matter. And here we talk a little bit of what do we save from, what do we save for? Now, um, I don't know about if Martin Luther really bought into it to that extent. He did to an extent. Because some of the things that he said are quoted by those who are now into the one saved, always saved. And they use, as he did, a couple of verses, for instance, from Romans. Let me use Romans chapter 8, verse 35 to 37, where it sounds like this. Can anything cut us off from the love of Christ? Can hardships or distress or persecution or lack of food and clothing or threats or violence? No, we come through all these things triumphantly victorious by the power of him who loved us. For I am certain of this, neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities, nothing already in existence, nothing still to come, nor any power, nor the heights, nor the depths, nor any created thing, whatever, will come, be able to come between us and the love of God. And that is used to justify eternal assurance. Now one thing was not listed in there, what is able to cut me off from the love of God, is me. <laughs> All right? He said, no external thing, if your love of God, if your relationship with God is sincere and intact... Nothing can come in and veto it. All right, he goes through a long list of things, but the one thing that's not there is me having a change of will. Just like to point that out. But another is chapter 10, verse 9 through 11, 9 and 10. Here's where it says, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe with your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. Hmm. Right. But if you took just that, if you took just that, and the scriptures never spoke about the topic anymore, you might say, hmm, I've got something I can maybe build on here. However, just a sampling of other scriptures that we should read as well. Philippians 2.12. So, my dear friends, you have always been obedient, but your obedience must not be limited to times that I am present. This is Paul again. It sounds a little bit like Galatians. Now that I am absent, it must be more in evidence. So, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. Hmm. Ouch. Matthew 10, 22. Jesus saying, You will be universally hated on account of my name, but anyone who stands firm to the end will be saved. Matthew 24, Jesus again, 13. Many false prophets will arise and they will deceive many with an increase in lawlessness. This was in the weekly readings this week, I think, or the week before. And love in most people will grow cold, but anyone who stands firm to the end will be saved. And Paul once again, and I, only, I limited it to four. We could do a lot more. In 2 Timothy 2.11, here is a saying you can rely on. If we have died with him, we shall live with him. If we persevere, then we shall reign with him. If we disown him, he will disown us. All right. So if you want to have an opinion on this subject informed by the whole gospel, you've got to bring in a little bit more than Romans 10, 9 through 10, right? Uh -huh. Because Paul and Jesus himself and in many other places talk about how necessary it is to persevere. In your initial faith in Christ. To deepen it. 
that it is defined by obedience. That's a saving faith. And it's obedience that must last all the way to the end. Right? Because as long as concupiscence, that desire for fleshly things, sinful things, remains in us, and it always does until we're perfected as saints, and our will is perfected above everything else, we have the ability to change our mind, to grow cold, to reject the grace of God. Okay? All right, so chapter 5, 1 through 6. Christ set us free. Remember the whole thing here we have to look at is free from what and free for what. So that we should remain free. Stand firm then. And do not let yourself be fastened again to the yoke of slavery. So he's talking to people that he says you are free because you believed. What he's anxious about, worried about, is that they'll change their mind and go back. All right? I, Paul, give you my word. This seems a little harsh in our modern thinking. If you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. I give my assurance once again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. <laughs> once you seek to be reckoned as upright through the law, you have separated yourself from Christ and you have fallen away from grace. We are led by the Spirit to wait in confident hope, wait in, wait in confident hope of saving justice through faith. Since in Christ Jesus it is not being circumcised or being uncircumcised, thank God he said that, that can affect anything. Only faith working through love. Okay, so for any of you men that got worried when I was reading that. <laughs> because we know in the modern age, Circumcision is very common, right? We don't do it to make ourselves Jewish. At least Gentiles don't. Christians don't, right? We do this, we do this for other reasons, all right? But it's no longer, it no longer has that implication. So what Paul said at that time, there was no reason except to induct you into the Jewish uh, tradition, all right? Which then obligated you then to follow a way to justification through the Mosaic Covenant that was uh, unsatisfactory. All right. In a modern day, that's not the context. So what he said there at the end, not being circumcised or unbeing circumcised, he basically said it doesn't make any difference. All right. Only faith working through love. That's the point. All right. What? So here's where, here's where he in, the, in here talks about that perseverance, right? You began your race well. Who came to obstruct you and stop you obeying? He didn't say stop you believing. You might still believe, right? Stop you obeying the truth, all right? So it's a race. It's a race to be won. It's a race to be completed. You're on the right course. You're born again. You've accepted sanctifying grace. Keep going, right? Achieve what you were saved for. You, be, you are now a child of God. Come to full age, right? And receive what he birthed you, adopted you to be. This language is so consistent in Paul that when you read all of Paul, how can you take one verse out of Romans and throw everything else out? Okay. I'm not going to read you. I wrote down another hmm, at least five verses from Paul, mostly, also from Matthew and John, that talks about this analogy that he liked a lot about running a race to completion. Other places he talks about fighting a fight to win. Who's the fight against? It's the fight against me, right? Oh, it's time. I'm sorry. All right, well, we... we we crack the seal on verse on chapter five anyway. Right. So in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Larry. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. St. Paul, pray for us that we may run our race to the end. Amen. Amen. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.